Got a lot of people. A lot of people. Hi. <coughs> See if I can get everyone's attention. These mics are on, I guess. That's good. Uh, let me just really quickly uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, let me just introduce the panel real quick. Uh, we're going to start at the far end. Allison Stern, who's CMO and co-founder of Tubular Labs. To her right is David Wong, who's SVP Digital Product Management or Development, sorry, at Nielsen. To his right is Eric Korsh, who's president of Mashable Studios. To his right is Peter Gorenstein, who's chief content officer of Cheddar TV. And to his right, Borgia Perez, who's SVP Digital and Social Media at NBC Universal Telemundo Enterprises, wins for longest title on the panel <laughs> by a wide margin. Um, the topic we're talking about today, obviously, is models for live video and how you all are going to make money in live video. Because it's a lot of fun to create live video, but it's a lot more fun to make money when you make live video. But I thought maybe as a great way to start, we've got about 30 minutes for this panel. I thought it would be great since we have a bunch of people who are creating and analyzing live video uh, across multiple platforms. What is working? Like when you look at live video right now, what are the obvious things or ways that live video from a content standpoint, what is working that you really see? Whoever wants to start. Allison, you analyze a ton of data. What are you seeing on the data side? Yeah. So Tubular is a video intelligence platform. Uh, we analyze 2 billion videos, including Facebook Live. So I kind of channel all that data through me to, to uh, give you a few insights from it. Um, one thing that's really interesting is that Facebook Live is extremely engaging. So we actually see Facebook Live videos are uh, twice as engaging as regular Facebook videos. And I think as What's the definition of engaging when you say that? Likes, comments, shares, any sort of social action taken on the videos. And so I think as we, um, as we start to monetize video, people often use engagement as a proxy for that. If people are engaging, then you know, they're more likely to buy products. It's more successful for brand and entertainment. And Facebook Live, we are, we are seeing that. Um, also, interestingly, you know, the Chewbacca mom is the number one Facebook Live video of all time, about 125 million views. Um, also seeing new, news, music, um, celebrities really popular in Facebook Live right now. Well, we have two news organizations, effectively, or two news um, services that shoot lots of video. Maybe from a Cheddar and Mashable standpoint, what are you seeing on the, the live video side that works? And do you notice when you do different things what works or doesn't work so well? I'll, I'll jump in. So it's still, for us, very, very uh, nascent learning phases. The two things that Allison mentioned, the pop press news, uh, climbing the Trump Tower, celebrities, John Hamm in the office, those things do well. Occasionally we have some hits with something that might have some anticipation built in, a la the BuzzFeed watermelon, whether it's a stunt or you know something more factual. Those things are doing well, but in general it's super experimental, so we're sort of really light on the data side for now. Peter? Uh, for us, so we, we Facebook Live is, uh, has been our main platform since the beginning, and, and uh, we're on Periscope as well, and we'll soon be on Twitter. So Facebook Live, so far, has been our, our main uh, focus and, and metrics that we get. Uh, we are, you know, we are primarily news focused, but anytime you add celebrity to that, that's interesting. We're, we take it in a much more granular uh, focus, like in terms of what topics do well. Uh, Politics, in a way, does well first. Like uh, we had Gary Johnson on this morning and talking about the libertarian cause that does well. Gaming does really well for us. Uh, weed topics do really well for us. Uh, products and and um, just regulation that that has done amazingly well for us. On top of you know our main focus, which I didn't is know technology. We were get into this conversation, so it does uh, well. But, uh, Whatever from an NBC Universal Telemundo standpoint. For us, we've been experimenting probably for the last four years. You know, as soon as you know the new platform arrives, you know, I remember back when it was the Meerkats, the you know the the periscopes. We were doing a lot of red carpet coverage during you know billboards, uh, Latin billboards, or or the Latin AMAs. Is now we have evolved more into the Facebook Live strategy, and and the reason why we are doing it is and it's, it's going to the topic is we try to bundle these products with other digital products in order to monetize. Um, uh, because uh, as a standalone, it's still difficult. The KPIs are not there. So we try to bundle that with other things. But uh, 
for us, the way we are seeing it is more like, now we have the technology, we have to create like a real programming strategy, making sure that it makes sense. You know, we are not gonna do a novella live because it doesn't make sense. Yeah. But probably our news uh, organization needs to create an entire uh, programming strategy to, to, to see how we are gonna be bringing those news to the Hispanic consumer that, by the way, the Hispanic consumer, it happens to be in the general market. So it's a very demanding uh, consumer that is expecting us to be there. And when you think about people tuning into live content, you know, Allison made a comment that it was twice as engaging as, as on-demand content, but yet we live in this world where increasingly we think about, you know, we live in a Netflix world where you watch mm. content whenever you feel like it. You don't actually tune in to watch Modern Family live on Wednesday nights. You tune in whenever you want to watch Modern Family. How do you look at the, we're in an on-demand world, but yet everyone on this panel and this whole event is about live. Is there, am I missing something? Well, from our point of view, you know, we have, uh, we, we are moving to eight hours of live programming every day, uh, starting in the very near future. And so, as we do that, and as we want to get on as many OTT platforms as possible, we look for big interviews or big moments for a, a jump, but we're also okay being the new ambient background screen that you have in your office or in your home if you want to have news on and just be in the background and not being your main focus. We're fine with that. You're okay being kind of a radio-like experience. Yeah. I, I think it's something that's lacking, actually. Do you, how do you think it's lacking if I can leave CNN on in my office all day? Well, in terms of our topic category, I think. And it's also, you know, our approach is different. We, we're, our colors are light blue and pink. And, um, you know, w w our whole approach from an aesthetic standpoint is, is a little bit different. And we want it to be kind of a, a better, more visual wallpaper. I mean, to jump in here a little bit, I know the original question you had was around um, what about this on-demand world, how does it balance out? And it's interesting because, mm -hmm. so at, at Nielsen, we've been rolling out new measurement systems um, this year and actually in the last, last little while to focus on measuring all the on-demand. Some new stuff yesterday. All the new stuff yesterday, yeah. Um, Just to be timely. Yeah, to be very timely. For this timely. panel. Um, out of home measurement, things like that. And, you know, it's, it's funny because live, a lot of times people think, okay, live video is dying, but in reality what you're actually seeing is that what is the, well, you're seeing the, the video and the content which is actually most relevant to be measured um, uh, or to be distributed on, on, on live. And what we're seeing is not actually that surprising, which is that it's sports and that it's serial dramas and it's any type of content which actually requires, a, that it makes sense to be able to watch live and that you're seeing things like modern family sitcoms and cartoons and things like that falling into on demand. So really I think what we're seeing, at least within uh, the Nielsen kind of view of the world and, and the, uh, the measurement that we're doing, is that there's, uh, uh, live is becoming, uh, is being highlighted as the best way to distribute some forms of content. Some is surviving best and that, that uh, on demand ends up being, again, a, a good distribution tool for the right type of content. Mm -hmm. one, one reality about live today, though, is it really is on demand as well. So take Chewbacca Mom, which has 150 million views. On I did not see it live. <laughs> right. So on day one, it had 25 million views, which is still um, very good. But you know, the, major the, the, the massive majority of views came after the fact. So I think one thing powerful about live is you run it live, and then it's there as content on demand after the fact as well. And um, I think that in terms of content but that- do you think it mattered that it was live at all? Like if it was never live and it had just gone up and it was a funny video and it caught fire, like does it matter that it's live, I guess is, is, a, is a kind of a fundamental question. Right, so I think you know, it splits into two parts. One is events that are currently viewed live which will now migrate onto social platforms. So take for example the debate. You know, a lot of people, the only way they engaged with the presidential debates was through Facebook Live or Twitter Live or, or any of these live platforms. And so things that people are used to watching live, Olympics, sports, reality TV, debates, all of that, um, you know, I think will start to move online. But then you have a second category of content, which is, um, you know, s sort of creating tent poles. Like BuzzFeed has done a lot of work around um, food art. So a lot of videos around like making a, uh, a huge mural out of Skittles or chocolate or like watching a cookie bake. And so all of these things that, you know, nobody watched live before are now becoming live. And that's an interesting dynamic too. So you have to try to generate demand for people to come and watch. And w when you think about the, you know, the whole concept of 
how you measure this audience, you know, because I think you know, we, we can talk all about creating content, but if we're going to get to, you know, basically monetizing, we've got to talk about how do we measure what's actually happening. So you brought up the debates, Allison, but like, David, maybe you can talk for a second. You know, I, I think about, you know, measurement and I go, when the debate's going on or whether Monday Night Football's going on, it's the average number of viewers spread across the entire, you know, hour and a half or three hour event respectively that I'm talking about. When YouTube gets up and talks about how many people watch the debates, it's viewers with an unspecified length of time. And you know, sometimes we're talking about Facebook where a viewer is someone who watches for a split second or two. Do we need to get some type of commonality across what's a view and what's engagement in order to monetize? Like, so you, that's, that's a, a, a huge, huge question that you've just asked. But I'll, I'll, I'll focus on a few things. You have like is, two minutes to I know I have like two nail minutes. it down. So, so the first thing is that live, <laughs> the good thing about live is that uh, live viewing is actually inherently easier to measure because it's just an event that's happening. It has a very defined time frame. It happens like the debate. It starts at 9.30. It continues on until 11. You can measure everything that's happening within that time as opposed to on demand, which could go on forever, right? You can keep on seeing views for months and months and months. Um, a, a few thoughts. The first is that views are not a great measure for live. Um, and that, that I'll just put that out there, because views are inherently a, a on demand type measure. It's did you go and request something, and then did it come to you? Whereas live, you're talking about, are you tuning into something which is happening live? And so you need to be able to understand um, how many people are watching, frankly, at every second and every minute of a piece of particular live, live content. You know, in, in TV, the reason why people average across is because it's convenient. Because uh, if you measure every minute and you average it, they actually, you know, you take a look at it. It doesn't vary too much. People tune in and tune out. But, you know, it's on average about, what, you know, whatever million number of people. I think what we're seeing for digital is that there's a lot more fluctuation. And so that's demanding. Um, <laughs> Having a bad day. Bad day. <laughs> they didn't like your answer. They like views. They like views. They, they like, like views. views. <laughs> Gary Vaynerchuk loves views. There we go. So All if right. views are bad, what is what's the right way right. to measure it? So I so not averaging audiences, but be able to show what the the uh, the, uh, the average minute audience or even the average you know, instantaneous audience is ultimately where we need to go. Average minute audience is good because it's a me meaningful amount of time. It actually captures the amount of time that people are engaged for a relevant period of time. And you can measure it as a particular piece of content goes, uh, goes through its live broadcast. So during the debates, I, I thought it was really great on Facebook, Facebook Live because you can see the average audience, not the average audience, the actual audience. You see the actual viewers at every second of the debate. Every single second. And, and you see be, the rise in the fall. It'd be crazy to be able to, to give every second of viewing, be able to say, okay, here's the research against, you know, against this piece of content. That'd be op often too much information. Um, but if you were to average, a, average out by minute and say, here's how many people you actually have, and it gives you something relevant to an advertiser, for example, to be able to say, how much engagement do I have in a given minute? How much, could I put, how much attention could I potentially get in a given minute of the, of the programming? And, you know, that's where, when, when Nielsen is rolling out a lot of these new measurement services, we're focusing on this concept of comparable metrics. What is relevant when you compare for the utility of the data for either research or for monetization? What is most comparable? And average minute audience ends up being a pretty good number, especially when you're starting to think about live versus TV and versus other kind of monetized platforms. Well, Borgia, you do both. You, you look at the TV world as well, or the linear TV world as well as the digital world. How do you react to that? Well, Does that work for you? It's, it's surprising because, like, for example, last uh, couple of weeks ago when we were doing the Latin American Music Awards, uh, we were able to, the way we measured, we have like 740,000 people uh, enjoying the Facebook Live that we did together with E. And then obviously we were having, you know, after we finished the red carpet coverage, we have, we ended up reaching in two hours 1.2 million people. That's the KPI that we use today. You know, that's kind of like what we used to go back to any partner and say, listen, this was the amount of, of views that you have during this period of time. But uh, we try to combine that together with, you know, other digital measurement and of course the rating of the show. Uh, we are not just reporting one thing individually and, and since Right now, we have that kind of like as a, as a point of reference. 
when we will do uh, now in November the iHeart Music Festival Latina, we will try to replicate the same thing and we will see if that red carpet also reaches a million views or a million two views. And, and based on, on repetition, we will be able to set up some standards on, on, on performance. Do the digital guys agree? Does it have to go beyond the view or is the view okay? I think that goes beyond the view to the demo also. I mean, if we're competing against cable, let's say the cable CBC business audience is 60 and older, and if we look at our Facebook numbers, it's pretty much everyone's 35 and younger. So that's very important to us, too. I just think we're not, we're not yet, you know, we're in a place where we're not providing really anything that new or fresh or different. Like, I don't know that we're really solving a consumer problem yet. Like, there's plenty of good live out there in other areas. So it's so early in our side. I feel like the big winner is Facebook looking at the data across what we are all doing. Any individual piece of content, like, is not, we can't learn that much from it. But Facebook, you know, that's why they're sort of funding that operation. But, but one of the things that is, is also, you know, kind of interesting is the other day when we were planning to do this Facebook Live, I, I asked my team, I said, okay, how are you going to promote this? How do you let that other audience know that we are going to have live coverage from the red carpet? Because if you have the anchor, you're right there, you know, on TV saying, and now you can enjoy this Facebook Live, that you're talking to a TV audience to let them know that they have another option. My point is how ahead of the time you start telling people, hey, and we are going to be doing this. You are reaching a completely different audience of the audience that they are watching TV, all the audience that they are doing the live stream on, on Telemundo.com. So promotion of that content is key uh, in order to create some, some sort of like uh, volume that later on you can, you can measure. When Barcel Sports goes live, I get a little pop-up on my phone saying, mm -hmm. you know, El Presidente is uh, live. So, I mean, I think notifications probably play a big yeah. role in that too in terms of having some relationship with your viewer. Cheddar, I get the alerts on my Facebook feed that you're live. I mean, I think that becomes a very important part of the game, which I, you know, I assume is not an easy thing to kind of ingrain in behavior. Well, it has to, because if you, if you use the platform, Facebook specifically, to just tell people about a tune in tomorrow or a week late, you're gonna kill your edge rack with basically messages that are not useful. So you're saying if people don't actually tune in, so like if you push out messages, you don't actually get a view. In a way, it's you, gonna actually penalize you in the future. Yeah, unless and so that's the big risk. And so you gotta make sure that if, you're, that if you send out a message that it's driving a quality tune in that someone's actually gonna hit the button on. Yeah, it's not just about shouting from the rooftop. That'll actually have a negative impact. And so when you think about monetization, you know, I, I spend a lot of time thinking about the traditional TV ad world and I look at how TV has moved online. Obviously, we've all had the TV everywhere experience of logging in with your Time Warner or Comcast password and getting kind of a, a long series of unskippable 30 second spots that are very repetitive. Like, as you all think about live video, and I realize that you know, we're streaming here on a Facebook feed that isn't actually being monetized beyond sponsorship, but like, should there be, like, what should monetization look like? I mean, should it be 30 second spots the way we're all used to, or should there be something new and different? Whoever wants to go first. Allison, should, smiling, you start. It should definitely be new and different. I mean, I'm the, I'm the uh, analytics person on the panel, not the content person. But as a consumer myself, you know, I think every time there's a new platform that, that develops, whether that was um, moving from newspapers to radios or radios to TV or TV to mobile or whatever it is, there's always a new form of content that, that takes hold. And I think that you're doing a disservice to your viewers and to advertisers and to the ecosystem if you're not trying to um, figure out new ways to, to monetize. So, um, you know, we've seen a real rise in branded content, sponsored videos, whether that be um, shout outs on air or whether that be um, using Facebook's kind of handshake tool to, to um, partner with a brand and, and sponsor something. But I think it's exciting to experiment and see what's going to work. Peter, you have some Soylent for us? <laughs> yeah, so what we've done, <laughs> that sponsorship is over. We don't, uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> what's the new one? What's the new one? bars on camera, too, because I know there's been a recall. Um, <laughs> but so what we've done is focused on making that ad a live part a live experience. So it's an integration within the show with brands we think fit our, our editorial. And can that scale? Why not? I mean, as long as we have the inventory. Can you scale it eight hours? I mean, you said you're going to be eight hours a day. Can you yeah. do eight hours a day of sponsored content? Well, it's not eight hours no, a day. No, like, but I mean, supported by sponsorship. Yeah, I think so. I mean, for now, I think that the struggle has been not enough inventory. 
So uh, I'm pretty bullish on our ability to add Eric, more what do you sponsors think? in an organic way. I, I mean, we, I, we believe in that same idea of doing the live uh, integration. Doesn't feel that scalable yet uh, to me. Because my, my fear is when I, you know, I, I was watching Mark Zuckerberg, you know, before the, I think it was before the second debate, he's sitting in his backyard, he's doing kind of a, a Facebook Live talk with his big green egg in the background, smoking meat and having his friends come over for a beer. And I'm just thinking, like, could you imagine if in the middle of, like, while he's talking, it goes, pause, we'll be right back with, you know, three minutes of messages from our sponsors, uh, you know, or, you know, 30 second ads. Like, you know, well, that's the whole, like the old Texaco, you know, pan over and there's the people on stage making the ad live. Well, no, no, I'm afraid the ad live. Like, for, what if it was just mid roll? Like, does mid roll mm -hmm. work? Like, can you actually do mid roll or do you actually have to do an integration I guess where the, it's a product he likes? Like, depends on the, the content. I mean, because we're not talking about an environment that's any different from the NFL. I'm watching a game, it's sponsored by Toyota. The game has a pause. Will I stick with it or not? But the game has pauses built in. Mm -hmm. The car chase that someone's filming on Facebook Live, or the, you, you mentioned Trump Tower. Mm -hmm. So would it have worked if you would cut to break and say, well, look, we're going to take two minutes of commercials to spend to, to make money on the Trump thing? Would people have tuned into someone else's feed? I guess is the risk, right? Yeah. Is that you, right, they how do you over. keep people engaged? To Allison's point but also try to monetize. So that's why I think we're not at monetization really yet. It's still a gimmick for us in any case. It's, yes, we can add this element. Nobody's coming just purely for Facebook Live. So I think we're saying, what's that content that people will stick with? And then we're going to figure out what that sort of environment has to be for us to monetize it. That's why I think we're so early. It's not about where should I stick that brand inside this event yet. So you do the, um, the music awards that you were talking about, you have a Facebook Live, how many people watched, or how many viewers, or how, how do you look at it? Like a, more or less like a million people. But you didn't make any money doing it? We did. Because you Actually, sold the sponsorship? Yeah, so we did branded content pretty much. You know? uh, right now, our approach to this is, is uh, branded content, um, and then also kind of like embed the message of, the, of our partners or advertisers within the content, you know, Try to be, trying to be organic. These platforms have been made for a very young audience that obviously they push back on advertising. So I think that at these stages it's very risky to start embedding you know, clear commercial message because otherwise you are at the risk of losing that audience. But all of you are using Facebook and Facebook's no, making no money off of all of you today. You're making money with your branded content, but all of this massive amounts of viewership is happening for free. You know, Facebook's not charging you and they're not making any money off of the sponsorships you're selling. For now. Do you think that's sustainable? But they're making money off of ads. I mean, yeah. they need... They but not need ads on your content. Right. No, but they need viewers to be on Facebook sure. and engaging with content. So I think, you know, it's, it's monetized just like their typical platform is. I mean, I think that, um, in fact, actually, the most successful live videos are um, 18 minutes or longer. So it's Why? like very... Why do you think that is? Uh, you know, I think people... Um, well, one thing is is that you, you actually need to have your, your Facebook Live going for a long time to give people time to land, right? So when you get that push notification for Barstool, um, you know, the longer that the live stream is going, the more likely people are going to have time to actually cross over and watch it. Um, but, you know, I think people start watching and they get sucked in and they get connected to the personalities who are talking. So um, you do see, you know, time spent. I agree with sort of the metrics around time spent and time watched, and I think that um, you know, Facebook Live is, is, and live video in general, you know, pushes that, that, those numbers up. But also, you know, I think the intensity of the content, you know, if you don't deliver good content that is intense enough, why, what's the purpose of being 18 minutes if you are not telling anything? You know, it's either go, you go five minutes with a lot of intensity, you can go half an hour. The soccer game, it could be a very, so, you know, boring game or a very intense soccer game. Well, did you see a lot of viewership of what you did last week after the fact, meaning non-live? On demand, afterwards, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they were more like, than what you had live. Uh, not in this case, you know. But again, I'm, I'm, I'm still, you know, it's how do you go back and promote? Who were we? You know, we were interviewing Pitbull. What was the interview with Pitbull on, on the red carpet? You know, it's, it's 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 an entire thing. You create the. Sometimes we forget, you know, these platforms they allowed you to do something, but we had to examine the content. We had to really deliver and say, okay, that audience that is going to be with me live, what are they expecting? 
if it's a younger audience, to whom I'm going to be interviewing on the red carpet that is appealing to that younger demographic? I might be interviewing somebody that is old and is not appealing to that demo. So it's about content uh, strategy first, and then making sure that you put it on the platform. And sometimes right now, we are all in the hype, like, oh, Facebook Live, and everybody is putting Facebook Live for whatever thing. Well, it was like Meerkat and, and Periscope. When they first launched, yeah. everyone was following everyone, and then you realize pretty quickly that most people are pretty bad at creating live video content. Yeah. Just like the early days of YouTube, right? There was a lot of bad content. So the early days of Vine, most people are not that creative in six seconds. I'm seeing kind of like going back to the, the days of digital distribution where you just put in you know, content from TV and distribute to digital channels. No, this platform has its intricacies and you have to work with that platform. You have to really create, the, the, if it's scripted, it's scripted, but you have to create that, that justification for people to engage. Otherwise, if you are gonna do live red carpet coverage as you do in TV and put it in a Facebook Live, it's not gonna work because the audience is expecting something different. Do you think long form, like 18 minutes plus, is the right strategy when you look at it, Peter, Eric? Like, well, there or is, is it really cutting it up because your audience is mobile and they want something that's snackable in 30 seconds or less because that's their attention I span? Just the first few minutes are what Allison said. We're trying to wait for people to show up. Like, so, so there's so many new things to learn that whether it's three minutes, five, 10, you're waiting for that audience to appear before you can even get going. And if you're gonna turn on that machine and invest in those resources, you need to get some time out of it. Like there's a bunch of outside factors that aren't even focused on what am I making for this audience. So we have not learned enough about that yet. When you think about devices, how much of this is being driven off of mobile or tablet? David, you wanna start? Well, maybe I mean, Allison. I mean, for, obviously for digital, digital live video, I mean, it sort of has to be on uh, some kind of digital device, right? So, of course, it's mobile and computer, which is driving it. Um, it's funny, and listening to this conversation, of course, as a, as a data and a measurement guy, can't comment too much about the, uh, about the creative or the, uh, or the ad format, but one, a couple of things which, which are really important about this is that, one, this is addressing um, a segment of the population which doesn't watch live TV as much anymore. So it is, you know, to the, to the, the point that you made around, we don't, we're not offering something new yet. There is a, a gap which is filled by digital live video, which is not filled by other forms of live video, which is that it, it can attract that younger audience, an audience that doesn't have or doesn't watch as much television anymore. So that's a new audience and a new- Or doesn't frankly, have a television. An, an, an important product you know, to sell to an advertiser. Um, and it's also an audience that might not watch as much, so it's actually incremental audience for, for advertising. You know, it's, it's also funny because we're talking about many of the same challenges that a TV network would face when trying to address live content. If you put on news or if you put on a sports event, how do you create the content so that people don't tune away? And how do they come back? How do you make sure that they know that it's scheduled at 8 p.m. Eastern instead of at, you know, 7 p.m. Eastern, right? Um, I remember I tried to tune into the Olympics and I was like, crap, it's not even, it's not playing yet? When, when is this thing starting, right? And they, you know, that was a challenge which had to, uh, that you have to, to resolve, so. Um, I think it's one of the questions the NFL's facing. Are there too many commercials during the NFL right, right? now? Right, you know, how do you make it so that it's not as interruptive? But at the same time, you know, making the content um, relevant so you want to come back, right? It's all about trying to come back. And, you know, to that, you know, to that end, I, I, actually, I actually agree with this point that longer form content is better for monetization because if something's short and you interrupt it, people just tune away. Right? Whereas if you, can build a, if you can build an attachment to an experience, people will retain you know, their attention even through a break. People will you know, go away for that minute, even two minutes, and actually come back and, and continue to watch, right? as long as they feel like they're not missing out. YouTube's role in live kind of announced something at, you know, earlier in the year, and I don't sense we've seen all that much. How does YouTube play into what you're thinking about doing live, or does it not at all yet? We, we experiment with that actually a couple of weeks ago. We were in Rome. Uh, we were, uh, we come the kind of like the partner of uh, the Foundation for the Pope, and there was a game for peace, kind of Maradona playing against Ronaldinho and friends. And, and we decided to go live on Telemundo.com, Facebook Live, YouTube Live, again, experimenting to see what was the traction. Um, we didn't have the, 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 the audience levels that we expected, but also it was experimental. So we didn't promote, I believe we didn't promote it properly. Uh, 
but the, you know, uh, for us, we will be like comparing what's uh, YouTube Live versus Facebook Live, what's the traction, and what, what are the, 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 the product that you can use in one or the other. Uh, it's new. YouTube Live has been far less successful for us than uh, Facebook Live and Periscope. And do you have any sense of why? I, I, I don't, I'm not exactly there's sure. I feel like there's less promotion, yes, but there's less uh, focus, I think, right now for their company to, to, to drive you there. Um, so it's been sort of a, an afterthought because in the beginning we tried and it just, it, it really never took off. And Twitter for live? Well, we announced a big yeah. deal on Twitter. We're, we're all in on Twitter. What about you, Eric? Uh, we're working with them on something coming up, and we'll see. I, I think partly these are uh, how, how people use the platforms or are used to using them. So, you know, Facebook is a certain discovery model that's different from YouTube. So I think those are part of the reasons that something does well or not well live on one versus another, right? You come to YouTube. you intend to sit down for some period of time, you're going to watch content, the length is less important. Facebook's a, a whole different model. That's why you know they're counting a view as three seconds. And Facebook announced earlier in the year that they were going to kind of create kind of this dedicated video experience where there would be kind of a whole world of video and a video tab and really hasn't broadly rolled it out anywhere in the world other than I think Thailand or something. Um, do you think it's a good idea to have a dedicated video world, or do you actually think you do better off within the legacy news feed and you don't want to be part of a dedicated video world as a content creator? Does it matter to any of you? I, I like that button. <laughs> yeah, it would make it easier for the audience to find us, sure. What about you? We, we are right now... It, again, the conversation the other day with our folks at the morning show in, uh, in Telemundo, Nuevo Dia, it's like, a, how, how should we do life? It's like, a, well, in the moment that you are doing live in the afternoon, you are no longer a morning show. So what are you going to offer? How? Why? What is this kind of, are you going to give more entertainment news? So then you are jeopardizing other properties that we have through, through it. We are trying to come up with an overall strategy on life for all shows, but we have to look first at who do we want to reach? Are we trying to do this to reach audiences that we don't reach through legacy platforms? If so, how do we have to live, how, how we have to do that? Uh, and it goes back to, you know, how, what's our presence in platforms like Snapchat when we are targeting a younger demo? Uh, what are they expecting from a brand like us? You know, what is, what is a 13-year-old thinking about Telemundo? Is, is that they're thinking about, is that the platform, you know, is that content that my grandmother used to, or, or should we present ourselves as, okay, we are the number one ent entertainment uh, content provider in Spanish, and if, if so, how we have to create a brand for that, that new audience. Um, I think that bringing, yes, what we have in TV and try to make it live sometimes makes sense, sometimes it doesn't make sense. There are shows that they will work well. There are shows that what you're going to try this is not going to work. Alice, when you look at the kind of battle between Facebook and Netflix, is live shifting the balance of power? And Netflix, you said? No, no, sorry. I said between um, Facebook and, and YouTube. Okay, yeah. Um, like long day. Uh, you know, I think that um, every... Because right, they're saying they're not really seeing much in terms of YouTube right. live. I assume you're not seeing much in terms of YouTube live from a, from a data standpoint today. Has it actually started to move the, the ship broadly because there's so much live content and so much engagement, as you said, on Facebook? Or is it not meaningful enough to shift? So I, I truly believe that each platform is its own special flower. I mean, I, I think that everybody, every platform has an advantage. I think the key in this video age is understanding the data, understanding the ecosystem so that you are creating the right content for the right platform for the right audience. And so if you are, um, you know, creating how-to style videos and uploading them to Facebook. I mean, I mean the community really is on YouTube for that. Um, you know, if you are um, uploading food videos but only to YouTube, you know, that might be a mistake because there's a huge food community on, on Facebook. And so it's really important to understand the data and understand these different communities. I think that one thing that's interesting about Facebook is 
so, so there are different behaviors, right? On YouTube, it's a, you go looking for content, how to, and, and um, gaming content, you, you, there's sort of an active searching, whereas on Facebook, it's much more of a pushing content to you. Um, and someone else on the, on the panel mentioned that. So I think that Finding impacts, content's actually the hardest thing. That, that impacts the behavior. Um, I also think that one thing interesting about Facebook is I do think right now video and live on Facebook is kind of a gold rush because if you think about the early days of Facebook pages and brands who were um, paying for likes and building their audience and that got them a lot of audience, but then that sort of dropped over time as everyone else jumped in, you're seeing that now on, on Facebook video. So if you're not making Facebook video or Facebook Live um, and you're a media company, I think that's a mistake because it is a moment to really build your audience and start, um, you know, uh, uh, and sort of have supersized growth overnight. That said, Online video as a pie is growing, so I, it's not taking away from YouTube. I think YouTube has an amazing um, space in the ecosystem and will continue, and, and everybody does, but there are different ways to play different platforms. You know, we've talked a little bit about uh, Facebook, a little bit about Twitter, and well, obviously YouTube. The platform we haven't talked at all about is Snapchat, uh, which is, you know, given the demos and the fact that it's mobile first and we probably either have ourselves, our friends, or our kids, that are on it incessantly. Do you think Snapchat's going to play a role in live video? Can they resist this wave? Well, no, in a way, it does. Um, you know, it's, it's started really only live. That was the only way you could upload anything. So their legacy and training of people using it was that. Um, but not in a broadcast fashion. No, not fair. in a broadcast. So even... But maybe, maybe that distinction is actually not material. It, right, like maybe so I, that's my mistake, actually. It, there's there's one-to-one -one live video. There's one-to-few. There's one-to-many. Like, there's all those those different variations. I Snap mean, you've got a Snapchat Discover channel. Yeah, and it is awesome. Like, Snapchat... <laughs> Wait, why do you say that? Why does your, your whole just face the scale, just lit up? The scale of it. The, and um, the monetization of it, I mon presume. Well, monetization, the scale, but the repeat visit. Like, when we talk about building an audience, right, like Facebook, it's not whether we're building it, it's whether the spigot is turned on or off, right? We have built it. Uh, Snapchat is, you know, a growing repeat. They come back every day. Like, that is just a freight train. So should, fa so should Facebook video tab have a magazine-like experience where, there's, where they're picking winners. I mean, because obviously Snapchat picked you as a winner. Hopefully they'll pick Peter as a winner soon and get Cheddar as a Discover channel or if they wanted one. But like, sh should Facebook be picking winners and, and defining what we watch? Or should they stay algorithm-based the way Google has with YouTube where whatever you're interested in is what surfaces? It feels like they need to stay true to the way people use Facebook less than them dictating how do I set up my tabs to get people to engage. So I, I feel like Snapchat, you know, whether it was accidental or not, has figured out a way to present content in a way that people like to pick and choose what they're going to consume. And Facebook, I, I think by adding, say, a pure video environment, that doesn't mean people are going to care about that. Are, are you concerned with the Snapchat's change in their <coughs> position with uh, Sure, for all, all publishers, I think, are. But what we are seeing is, you know, we had some runway, to Allison's point, of building an audience that we, we did, in fact, build, and they are coming back every day. So, Yeah, I don't know. sense it's actually had a major impact on, on usage, despite being... I mean, it's really early. It's only right, right. Well, from a content creator uh, point, I don't think it matters, but your sales team is probably concerned. Uh, yeah, well, they're concerned, you know, for if traffic a few goes different down. things. Right, well, in the... Recode article about you know Snapchat really trying to own that right. completely. Well, do you build a direct business for video monetization? I mean, it's actually the great comment that we probably should get to in the last couple of minutes here is all of you right now are distributing live video over other people's platforms rather than your own. Should you be developing your own destinations for live video where you don't have to worry about somebody saying, well, this is how you monetize or this is how you don't monetize or hey, we're replacing you with somebody else? Like how? How important is having your own destination for live video? I think, you know, there is a codependency between the content and the platform. And, you know, we have to stay uh, clear on what we do best. We are, we are a content producer. We are the second largest content producer in the world in the Spanish language. That's what we do best. And, and I don't think that we will be good at building platforms. 
So our job is to continue to develop the platform, to make sure to develop the content, to make sure that that content talks to uh, this audience, and then pick the platform, because platforms are going to come and go, you know. And and you know, again, I'm, I'm, we did Meerkat, then we did Periscope, and now we do Facebook Live, and we will continue to do whatever it happens two years from now. Our job is to work with companies like Snapchat, understand, you know, the platform and, and how consumers connect with the content in that platform and trying to co-produce co, co with them content that it will be appealing. But we are a content producer. We are not a tech company. You feel the same way? Well, we, have, we will soon have uh, just a linear feed on, on our uh, app and Cheddar.com and, and all of our TV. And is that what you want to be the primary? Well, I don't th no, it won't be the primary, but we want it just to be a uniform experience. When you think of Cheddar, you think of a linear feed, and that's it. You're going to have to measure a lot more, David, soon, and so are you, Allison. More destinations. Well, I mean, ultimately, I think it's, from a measurement perspective, it's, it's a challenge, but it's a good thing because fragmentation ultimately gives consumers more choice, and then it means that you can make the best choice between which distribution platform you have. And so from a measurement perspective, like we are just trying to make sure that we cover every single platform. We can provide the metrics so we can see the different dynamics. I mean, I love the idea, the, the, the concept that everyone sits on special flower because you can then see <laughs> what it does, right? Does having daily repeated re like return through Snapchat, does that do better than an on-demand flow through Facebook or YouTube, things like that. And that's ultimately what, what Nielsen and I'm sure Tubular, we're all trying to do with metrics. And Someone cut down the vine flower. The, the more complicated it gets, the better it is for the measurement. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, like four, four years ago when Tubular started, it was really only YouTube as a major, major video player. I mean, it's pretty wild in the last four years. I mean, you know, that we, you, we've even seen Meerkat come and go. I mean, like so many people have. have now have, it's called House Party. Yeah, now, now it's, you know, you, you have Facebook, you have Twitter, you have Live, you have the apps, you have OTT, you have HBO Go, you have all, all this content. Um, although I actually, I, he I heard you say content a lot, and I was reading something the other day that we really should call it storytelling, because content like devalues um, the, the concept of what people are creating, right? Because I, I think it is the age of the platform. That's just the reality. That's how people are distributing their stories. And so um, that does put, put the balance a little bit out of whack in terms of um, the platforms having a lot of leverage in terms of monetization. Um, but at the same time, the platforms are very reliant on the, on the content because that's why people are there, to see amazing stories and to, to engage with it. Thank you all. We're out of time. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for that awesome panel. Don't go too far. The next session.